All right, thank you so much, uh, Danielle, for that introduction. Uh, we've heard some really inspirational talks today, and I think I'm going to take it and uh, turn this into something maybe a little bit more applied. So I hope you'll be able to get some value out of what I'm going to talk about today. As Danielle said, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Oso Technologies. Uh, we're a startup company that's based here out of the U of I uh, that was started by some grad students. And what I wanted to talk to you today about is the, you know, what comes after you've finished that pursuit? What happens once you're done with your Kickstarter or your Indiegogo or your self-starter campaign and you have to get into those nitty-gritty details in order to achieve the, uh, you know, the results that you promised people whenever they believed in you? So I want to start out by saying that, uh, well, there we go. The following is based on a true story. So everything that I'm going to be telling you today comes out of my own experience. You know, some of the things that I did or my team did might not apply to the situation you're in. But I think that there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between what I've done and what you might be doing uh, in the future. So how many people here have ever backed a uh, crowdfunding campaign before? Raise your hand. Great. And how many people in here have ever thought about or are in the process of getting ready to launch their own crowdfunding campaign sometime? OK, great. So uh, yeah, I want to talk about some of those details. So where did our company come from? Well, we started out by uh, running into kind of an unusual problem. Uh, we were killing a lot of plants. Um, so in 2011, my wife and I uh, had this problem where we got a basil plant, and we took it home, and the plant started dying. And I was really frustrated because I kept going through this cycle of buying a plant, incorrectly caring for it, and then watching it die. And I think a lot of people have been through this before. And uh, it was after becoming frustrated with it myself that I thought, you know, what if I took some of the technologies that I've been reading about lately and applied those to this problem and built a system that would stop me from killing my plants. And what I'm talking about here is the concept of the Internet of Things. If you haven't heard the phrase the Internet of Things before, it's the phrase that's being used to describe uh, the connection of physical machinery and network sensors with software so that we can take all of the different uh, technologies and devices and concepts that have been developed in the last 15 years and apply those to the physical world. So we're sensing things, we're giving people feedback, we're helping people make decisions more easily so we can reduce that stress in our lives that come about from technology on such a regular basis. Uh, and so you can see, you know, this graph shows the, uh, the search traffic for the term Internet of Things over the past five or so years. And it's really taken off lately. Uh, just in the past uh, few months, Nest, the uh, learning thermostat company, was purchased by Google for over $3 billion. So there are a lot of really big names in uh, you know, industry that are starting to pay attention to the Internet of Things. And I'm proud to say that we started our company, Oso Technologies, uh, in the fall of 2011, before the real interest in the Internet of Things started. So I think this is the only time in my life that I can actually be a hipster about something and say that I was into it before it became cool. Uh, so we took this, you know, this idea of applying Internet-connected sensors to a problem, and we developed this product. Uh, and that, problem, that product is called PlantLink. So PlantLink takes moisture sensors, it connects back to a small hub, and that hub uploads things to the internet. And from there, you get information about uh, you know, the, the, the properties of the soil, and you can know when to water your plants. So a pretty simple idea, uh, but you know, we wanted to get it out there, and we wanted to see if people really wanted to purchase it. So we launched a crowdfunding campaign. We used Kickstarter. You can use lots of different platforms for this. Uh, and things went re really well for us. Uh, you know, we were trying to raise $75,000 to see if people actually wanted to buy this product before we devoted a lot of our lives to it. And we ended up raising almost 100000 uh, And then we were also, you know, we got some great press from people like TechCrunch, CNN. Uh, we inspired a top 10 list on The Late Show with David Letterman. And my own personal uh, high point in my career, I inspired a joke in Conan O'Brien's monologue. Uh, so, you know, it was a really good time. We felt great about everything. Uh, we were successful. It felt like the world was our oyster. Um, and we kind of lived through, I think, the typical crowdfunding story that you hear from a lot of people. We came up with a cool idea. We built something that was really neat. Uh, and then we launched this campaign out into the world. People responded, and we made a bunch of money. So it seemed like everything was great. Uh, but then the aftermath happened. And that's kind of what I want to talk about for the rest of my talk today. You know, this isn't just based on a true story. The, what I'm about to tell you is the true story. So this is the stuff that you might not hear as much when you're getting those updates from your crowdfunding campaigns or hearing people talk about how their, um, you know, their process of building their products went. These are the things that, uh, you know, these are the landmines that we didn't know about going into it. And I want to share some of that in the hopes that other people will be able to learn from the lessons that I've learned uh, and become more successful in the future. So what are some of the ways that we could have failed even after we were initially successful? 
Well, the first one would be uh, our timeline. Great. So our timeline uh, just went out the window as soon as our campaign ended. We had estimated that we were going to be able to deliver our product uh, by June of 2013. And we ended up shipping uh, in March of 2014, which is about nine months late. Uh, now, the average crowdfunding campaign is about six months late, so I don't feel too bad about being just a little bit worse than average. Um, but, you know, that timeline, it had a lot of things in it that stretched out uh, for reasons that we just didn't know were coming about. So, you know, one of those things was uh, doing a lot of hardware testing. We had to go through different processes to make sure that our hardware was actually up to snuff so that we could produce thousands of units. We had to get certifications from the FCC. We had to manufacture things on a different scale than what we initially originally anticipated with the product. And all of this kind of added up to just eating up more and more of the time. And that means that you, know, you have to communicate with your backers. You have to make sure that people know the reason that you're taking longer than you originally anticipated. And that can become really frustrating. And I've seen a lot of campaigns that have kind of gone off the rails because they're not able to manage that communication structure. But we had some great mentors that helped us see through these problems. Um, we were able to overcome that. Another issue uh, that popped up that we weren't expecting that I've heard of a lot of times happening with other people uh, is the team. So this kind of abstract chart shows the people that have been involved with PlantLink from the first meeting of the company all the way through today. So we started with five graduate students, and then right after we launched our Kickstarter campaign, two of the people that we were working with uh, decided that they didn't want to be a part of the project anymore for lots of very valid reasons. You know, they had other jobs, they had families in another part of the country, and they ended up not being involved anymore. So we had to replace those skill sets. Uh, and then some of the people that we decided to pick to replace skill sets, they didn't work out, and we had to pick other people. And we had to bring in other people that were totally different areas than we thought we needed at first. And there was just a lot of flow going on around the team, which is something that we hadn't really anticipated. And luckily for us, we had great networks and contacts with people that were able to bring their expertise in, that were able to recommend friends or former colleagues that were able to help us get through these issues. But without those substitutions and without those new people on our team, we would not have been able to finish our project. Uh, and that was something that we didn't anticipate going into this. So I think knowing that there's the potential for new people to have to come on board or even swapping out some of those key members of your original team, that's the kind of thing that you really need to be wary of uh, before going into a campaign like this. Another thing that could have caused us to fail were all the unknowns. There are so many things that come up when you're producing a product in a short amount of time and you've never done it before that are impossible to you know, foresee. Uh, the sticker that I'm showing there in the top left-hand corner of that slide uh, shows that we have FCC compliance for PlantLink. And that seemed like it was gonna be a really easy thing to do. We were using off-the-shelf components that were pre-certified. Everything seemed great until we actually got to the testing facility. And then we had to spend thousands of dollars and almost two months redesigning our boards so they would get through that certification process. That pushed our manufacturing back into the holiday period, which pushed everything back more. It ended up costing us almost three months of time. Uh, and you know, we just had no idea that that was going to be as big of a problem as it was. Uh, when we went into manufacturing, we had to answer all these questions about what are we making our tools out of, uh, you know, what specific dyes are we using to achieve the colors that we picked out, uh, what types of plastic are we using, how are we programming things. And then once you solve these problems and you make these decisions, you can end up having something else that happens that makes your original decision invalid. Uh, there's a picture there in the center of uh, one of our links, the sensors, that's hooked up to a programming module that we had to hack together in about 12 hours because our original method of programming uh, you know, 3,000 sensors ended up being impossible because of a manufacturing change. So there's all these little things that are unknowns that are going to pop up. And if you're not able to you know, bring to bear all the different uh, skill sets and the things that you've learned in the past and the people that you've connected with, it can be very daunting to overcome these challenges. Uh, another challenge that we ran into uh, later on in the game was shipping. You know, what happens when you have to ship 3,000 packages to a bunch of people around the country uh, and you can't use a traditional UPS or FedEx solution because it would be way too expensive? Uh, you know, we ended up having to find a logistics partner that could come in and take everything and ship it to the other side of the country and then drop ship everything else to people. And it seemed crazy to me that shipping stuff all over the country ended up being as f about a fourth as expensive as just going through a normal UPS uh, you know, option, picking up things from our office. So exploring those options, you know, reaching out to the people that reached out to us when we did our Kickstarter campaign, it was so important to follow up with all those people. You know, that network of people is the thing that really gets you through all those issues. Uh, and really, you know, all the different things that I'm talking about here kind of come down to one issue. You know, the time, the people, uh, the logistics, the problems that came up, 
all of that you know, goes into the amount of money that you have in the bank as a company. So the graph that I'm showing here uh, is a graph without units that shows roughly our bank account over the past uh, year and a half. And that's plotting, uh, you know, the top of that graph is, is much higher than the amount of money we raised on Kickstarter. And the bottom is more than zero, so we never actually ran out of money, which was great. Um, but you can see over time how that number drops off. And if we hadn't been able to uh, work with a lot of really fantastic investors and people here in the Champaign-Urbana community that were able to help our company you know, reach the financial um, you know, stability that we needed, we wouldn't have been able to deliver our Kickstarter uh, rewards at all. And that's a really scary thought to me. You know, we thought that we had done a lot of really great estimations. We had talked to people. We had double-checked our numbers. Uh, but we were still way off. And so, you know, people talk about how these things are roller coasters or running a startup can be a roller coaster. And I don't think that there's any graph that shows that better than this one. There's a lot of ups and downs that come through this process. And making sure that you're so tied into your community that you can, you know, find the people you need to solve your problems, I think is the ultimate lesson from everything that I've done through this entire crowdfunding campaign. So in the end, the real crowdfunding story is that you have to give yourself extra time you want to make sure that you prepare for changes that could happen in your team uh, and, and upsets that might um, come along. You have to figure out what you don't know as you go you know, through the process. And then you have to give yourself the extra amount of money that you might need to be able to be successful through the entire thing. And ultimately, all of these things come down to making sure that you're connecting with the people that you need to talk to uh, to give you the resources and the tools uh, and the knowledge that you need to be successful. So if you don't know anybody that can give you those tools to succeed, now you kind of know me. So find me, reach out. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, you know, I'm always happy to talk to people who are thinking about launching crowdfunding campaigns. And hopefully you can learn from the mistakes that I've made and pursue an even higher level of success. Thank you so much.